Okay, these first parts, who are we talking to? Move in. Why can't you answer me? Why is that a question? I'll help you pack. Me. <laughs> Seriously, who are we talking to? Let's just, here it is like it is on the page, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Woo, okay. Whoa. Uh, what is this? Is this a gun? This is this is a gun. Is this a, what what is this? Nothing. Go to sleep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at all the beautiful people. I tell you what. I am not going to keep you awake. Get Paul up here right now. Paul, get over here. Easy done, Jack. You all right? Okay, now take it easy. Paul, can you tell us how long it's been since you shot up? Two days. Congratulations, Paul. You are cured. I started uh, in visual effects, um, and I've always acted. And uh, through visual effects, I met a lot of local Atlanta people. Um, I took some acting classes. Uh, and I've always written and done photography, so um, there was kind of a nice transition from that into directing small uh, industrials and commercials um, that had visual effects involved. And then from there, I did short films. Um, it's kind of been like an ever evolving thing and uh, then um, started full time directing. Uh, I'm rep for music videos and commercials and right. then we did Heavy Water two years ago and this is my first feature. So it was kind of a, an attempt to make something big for almost no money um, and kind of pool all the Atlanta talent I work for and all the other stuff together and make something, make something cool. Cool. Yeah. So like, did, is this something that you kind of always knew you wanted to do or did when did when did you discover like maybe I want to be a filmmaker? Uh yeah, you know, it's like I said, like I I had always taken photos, I'd always acted or taken acting classes. Um and then Where did I, you take some classes? Um I took a couple minor classes in New York. Um cool. there's a a lady named Maggie Gormley who actually studied directly under Adler who mm -hmm. I uh, I did uh, six months with and I went to NYU there. Right. Um, so I took their acting program and then um, Sheldon Schiffer in Atlanta I did a little bit um, but uh, yeah so it was kind of just like a, the, a very easy next step progression where you know I did this thing you know professionally that kind of was very very involved in film so I get to be around the environment and then all my interests were in that area so kind of uh, early 20s you know um, I mean even in college it was kind of it just made sense and everything I enjoyed was kind of in one medium so it was, uh, it was a pretty easy progression to get to get into it. So did you grow up watching a lot of films? I know your oh, brother's yeah. a filmmaker too. Did, did you have like parents who kind of like? No, I actually did. Uh, he's he's my older brother, but I actually did it before him. So oh, really? um, it's funny because yeah, it's um, 
Uh, we both always loved movies. Um, my dad, no, my parents weren't involved in, in the movie scene or art scene at all. My dad put on events. Right. Um, but that's what got me into visual effects is I actually, when I was like 16, I did an internship with um, mm-hmm. the, the guy who did all the, the motion graphics for his conferences. So right. um, that was kind of my first introduction. And that got me onto like DC Shoes commercials and Chick-fil-A commercials and stuff by the time I was 18. So I got a nice... So what, like, what were you doing on that? Uh, I was doing all the compositing and the visual effects. Oh, really? you were so it, was, it was a small company called Blister Studios, so there was okay. like four of us. So it was kind of when there was too much work. Right. It was a very awesome opportunity where I got to, as an 18-year-old kid, like jump onto these big productions and act like a, a grown-up visual effects supervisor. You know? right. So it was, it was a nice introduction, and I got to learn a lot about the process even before making the decision to do directing. So it was super, super nice. And yeah, my brother... Um, he has similar interests. He's much more uh, documentary and likes kind of operating his own camera and not having a crew. But same thing, we both grew up loving movies and you know, it's movies were the one thing that I kind of always loved and were consistent and I kind of like mark certain, you know, periods of my life with films I've seen and it's just yeah. always been something that I really like. So cool. yeah. What about you, Jeremy? How'd you get into this? Um, <laughs> for me I went to to undergrad to, to draw and paint. So I just oh, came okay. at everything sort of from a gallery background. That's but that cool. really ran into comic books. I started doing writing and drawing my own comic books. Oh, cool. So I was, I was traveling the country doing the indie circuit, and we would start to do little uh, online commercials for the books okay. to, to try to help, you know, get What are they? Are they like something we could see, like, anywhere? Well, probably not. Oh, really? Maybe, hopefully not. It was, oh, okay. Um, it, I did a book called German. Right. Uh, which is like a semi-autobiographical uh, comic uh, where I really wanted to take kind of like a, what we get in like a personal indie story but right. the great thing about comics is your special effects budget's infinite so yeah. you can run around and punch Nazis in the face or whatever you might want to do <laughs> so uh, I did a book like that I yeah. did a book called An Open Place which was uh, kind of like a Jacob's Ladder kind of story so were you always just drawing as a kid or like, how did you get into that? How do you, uh, that's always interesting to me. Uh, 100%. Like, uh, I, I just remember being around my, my grandfather and he would, I think to keep me occupied, yeah. would be like, look, you can do this with a pencil. Oh, he kind of taught you. And then I'd be like, oh yeah, like this. And he's like, great, you're not exploding right. anything right now. This is good. So constantly drawing and then eventually you start writing so you can have a story to draw. Interesting, yeah. And then that led into a lot of gallery work and the same mm-hmm. thing happened there. So. We would do gallery work and then we maybe do video work in the space or video work to to make it known that we were doing that kind of stuff. And then eventually the next step just became, all right, let's go ahead and make make a film, which in wow. the first feature film was Locomotive. Okay. So th- that's what I was going to ask uh, next. Is this So the film that's in this festival, Heavy Water, and it plays like Love, is that... I know. Th- I believe this is your first feature, right? Mm-hmm. I know yeah. you pretty well. And, and is, is this your first feature? No, Locomotive was done two years ago. Okay. And it plays like Love is the second feature. Oh, the second feature. Okay, awesome. And um, and so, did you guys start off doing shorts? Um, did you, Jeremy, did you start off doing shorts, or did, or what else did you do before that, or did you no? Just it would right it would have been it would have been like you know fully interactive video in a gallery exhibition, right? Which was already narrative based, okay. and then it was straight from there into a feature. Okay. What happened is I was in New York, uh, and who, my co-writer now, Adam Lucas, we started right. an open place productions together. I was like, I'm going to <clears throat> jump into a feature. He's like, great, let's do that. Yeah. So the first thing we did was Locomotive. It was actually based on a, a screenplay, the first draft of a screenplay he had done. Okay. And you directed that one? I directed that film. And cool. then It Plays Like Love is the second feature, and that was the first draft of that I wrote. And we actually wrote them at the same time, year, like maybe four years before we even decided to ever actually shoot them. Gotcha. So, so, um, what, so did you guys, what about your school background? Did you guys, I know you said you went to you, like a year Yeah, I NYU? went to, yeah, I did a year at NYU and then a, uh, two years at Georgia State and then dropped out. Did you um, study film? I did, yeah. So that was, you know, going from visual effects into film. I kept doing visual effects professionally while I was in school. Right. Um, while, you know, taking acting classes and stuff like that. But um, you were almost like working, it seemed like you were working professionally almost before you went to school. I, I mean, it was, it was pretty steady. After I, I did that little internship, it was, right. I had clients. So it was like a nice supplemental income. I didn't, you know, I wasn't working like 80 hour weeks or anything. Like right. That, but yeah, I was definitely continuing doing it through school. And then like when I came back to Atlanta... Um, the first year I was on, you know, over a dozen, two dozen sets, mm-hmm. um, sometimes working for free, sometimes doing visual effects for cash. Yeah. But, 
Yeah, so it was a nice integration where I got to meet a lot of people. Um, is that how you learned? Because that because you know so much. You're you're pretty young, if I can say. It. Yeah. And and you know so much. I mean, you're almost like a, a molder to you. You're like a mentor to me when it comes to like <laughs> cinematography and stuff. Yeah. And I'm I'm constantly like you know texting you, asking questions, and this guy like oh, he'll send me you know quick answers and oh, like these very in depth yeah um, answers. But where so where do you where did you learn all that information? Uh, it's mostly self study. I, I didn't love school. Um, I'd say the the uh, the acting courses I took at NYU were the only thing that really have stuck with me in a big way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually was going to leave school entirely just to work, uh, right. but the parents were like, "Yeah, we'll pay for pay for your college if you keep going in Atlanta." So right. I was just using that as kind of like, "All right, well, I'll get free lodging and yeah. try to figure out for sure how it's going to work." Yeah. Um, yeah. In the next few years, it was just kind of you know I. I like I said like I'd, I'd always been interested in photography, always in acting, always in writing, mm-hmm. and you know I was the kid in high school where I always preferred to stay home and like experiment with a camera as opposed right. to you know going out and hanging out with friends and not that I didn't have friends, but it was it was like just very introverted and you know always very very much into learning more as a hobby. Right. Um, so yeah, it's it was just like a very slow progression, and you know because I like all those things, yeah. you know, I just tried to actively you know immerse myself in all so the, pa- the passion perhaps is the, that, that's like one of the questions I had is like um, and, and maybe I'll throw this one at you Jeremy like where do you find like your motivation to do this stuff because it obviously is a <coughs> tremendous amount of work and not always a lot of payoff but. Um, it's different for different projects uh, the first film Locomotive what was interesting about that because we we actually sat down and looked at all these screenplays we had right. and we could have produced any of them uh, the reason we went with that one at the time was it just seemed like how do you pull this one off it financially wasn't the issue but like story wise it seemed like a challenge or it like seemed like a little bit of a riddle yeah so that one was interesting based on that yeah and it, we were um, it was actually the last day of shooting that we were in a funeral home right and everyone was exhausted it was like a really long day we yeah. crammed all this stuff in there everyone's kind of sick because they're freaked out and I, oh. in there I was like oh the next film is going to be a place like love I, something about <laughs> being in that space I was like let's do a romantic comedy right so was it? After so that. was the first film like a, of a different uh, genre, with like dif- different nature? Yeah, I mean, it it, it has, definitely has these components of like a documentary feel, more gotcha. of a kitchen sink style, you know, slice of life. Was it more of a drama? That's yes, right. for sure. Okay, so you wanted to like maybe switch things up. So do you feel like maybe that you were trying to challenge yourself to do some new things? And is that, is that what motivated you, or? Um, Maybe not off the top. It was right. just like, of all the other content we had at the time, that seemed like, this is different. Yeah. Let's go this direction. Right. Uh, the, the, only, the only real thing I knew I definitely wanted to do was go up. Like the thing that we were told the whole, like from writing to acting to yeah. editing for the second feature, my main thing was like up, up, up. Right. For everything. Yeah. So maybe that was what kind of interested me on the second project. Like, let's, let's do a tone shift. Gotcha. Yeah. And so, like, what do you mean? Like, you said up, up, but what do you mean? What's that? How do you define that? So if, uh, let's say you're doing a scene that's like a breakup scene. Right. Like, you're not going to break up right now. <laughs> no. I, I feel like, see, look, he went sad immediately, right? Yeah. That's... Well, you're so nonchalant about it. <laughs> I know. It just, <laughs> yeah. That's how it is in my film. <laughs> so, like, the, the normal inclination would be, like, oh, it's a breakup scene. It should be down. Right. Well, let's flip the tone of that immediately. Okay. Like the feeling is not there. Something right. something horrible happens. Rather than dive down, it was up. Yeah. So anytime you were maybe maybe an actor is looking for something, right. maybe I'm looking for something in a scene. If you lose focus for for a place like Love, the idea was up up up. Okay. Just in terms of tone. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's <laughs> interesting. It's really interesting to hear like where. Um, uh, so let's talk about that. Well, actually, before I do. Um, uh, why a feature? Yeah, it's, you know, all these projects are kind of like an ongoing experiment and you just can cram the most into a feature. And uh, I'm interested in TV next because I, I like the idea of like a five season story. So, yeah. I don't know, I just feel like, you know, it's... Or for you, this film, like why did you choose a feature? The thing I hate about shorts is like after the 12 minutes of the short, you barely know the character and you barely give a shit. So right. half of the narrative experimenting and the half of the you know, the fun stuff happens after you know who the characters are, you know what your context is, all right. that stuff. And you really can't do that in short form, you know? So yeah. it's I mean you can to an extent, but it's just like it's 
you have a much more creative freedom when you know you can move past the exposition and then get into the meat. You know what I mean? Right. So it's just always interested me, and I always feel like there's you know a lot more to to gain uh, once you kind of get past the what is this about phase. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What about you, Jeremy? I'd say almost exactly the same thing. The yeah. just the length of it allows much like a bigger deep dive into a, whatever yeah. your content area is. So yeah. You know, in, in five minutes, are you really going to, mm-hmm. you can only go so far with that. Like, by the end of five minutes, can I emotionally devastate a, a character that you don't care about? Right. <laughs> probably not, but two hours in, you probably feel pretty well lived with them, so I can hit them with a bus, I can do all sorts of things, <laughs> and yeah. and it's going to be a totally different experience you have with that. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Um, so what about, like, where did the birth of these films start? Like, um, just, like, how did it... How did this just in these films in specific? Um, how did it all begin? Um, I wrote two features in school that were like not great, um, and there was one or two scenes in one called Forgotten Graves that was about a homeless cult that I I really really liked a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was I think the impetus for for Heavy Water, um, and then that mixed with a bunch of stuff I was going through and thinking about and how I felt about religion and and what it meant to you know, find a home, all those things together were kind of swirling. So right. yeah, it came out of that feature. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, uh, I spent six months writing it and then we spent six months in pre-production and it right. kind of started out as this like, oh, this is an idea. And it's like, oh, we could actually make this. And it's like, oh, this is actually being made. We're actually the ball of the yeah. rolling. So it just kind of like the momentum just kept going until we were in full on pre-production. Yeah. And what about, what about you, Jeremy? Like what was the like just maybe the big inspiration or the, the birth of it how did it all begin uh, I was living in the middle of the woods in Florida and it was yeah. hot and I was biking 10 miles to a job and back every day in the, in yeah. the heat so I was probably mildly heat stroked every day uh, and I just started writing this sort of um, at the time it was maybe less comedic more romantic mm-hmm. and it, and I, I was really in love with it. I thought it was great. And then 500 Days of Summer came out. And there were so many scenes in that film. I was like, oh, I just did that. Okay. Yeah. So, so I wrote it kind of half to length and then put it away. Right. And then years later, you know, two, three years later, uh, when making Locomotive, we pulled it back out then and started to rewrite from that point on. Right. And it was, the, the structure changed, the characters changed, everything changed at that point. So you, were, you started off almost writing another project. Is that, I mean, in, in, in your film, it, there's, a, there's a play within a film, and, um, and you, I, I, you know, we talked a little bit the other night, you were saying like how this play was something you actually wrote, intended to, to be a play, is that correct? Or did, well, did I that there was the draft, yeah, there's the right. first, first, third, 25th yeah. draft of, of the film proper, gotcha. and at that point, um, Adam was like, well, if we're doing this thing about a play, we should also write the play. Right. So okay. then we, you know, I did a quick run of that. Yeah. And then we go through and re- rework the whole film with this new idea of where everything should be. You know, after right. That. Yeah. That was interesting. Um, so, so you had the, this, like, you know, this, I guess, this early inspiration. What was, like, your very first next step? When, when, when did, you know, when you decided you wanted to make the film, what did you do next? The first step? For A Place Like Love, we are, we had built a team of, collaborators that we already really liked working with on the first right. film. So did you just call up your go-to guys or how did you that... You basically, yeah. I mean, yeah. You, prepare, you prepare a package, you send the draft around, and if it's strong, right. actors want to come back, the team wants to come back together. And, right. then, and then after that, you start to seek the resources to do it beyond the team. So how many people like did you already had worked with in the, in the past? And who, you know, how, like, you know, what percentage of them may have been new people? Or? Uh, I mean, we, we try to work with everyone again. Right. Uh, it's just whether we can or not. So um, we had two cinematographers on the first film. They both right. came back. We had two editors on the first film. They both came back. Yeah. Our sound guy also came back. Um, we tried to work with as many of the actors again. Mm-hmm. Um, the lead from our first film right. was also a musician. So yeah. even though we didn't have a part from in the second film, he wrote some music for it. Okay. Um, so this is like almost like you guys have a production company almost as an ensemble. Yeah. And that very much is, is what it is. Yeah. What was the name of the company? An Open Place. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, and, and so what about you? What was your next step? Uh, not too dissimilar. It's, um, yeah, it's, you know, I, I had my DP I always work with, who's a good friend of mine. And mm-hmm. um, like I said, because I've been working on shows and, and doing videography throughout the city, like I already kind of had my, 
my my dream team built of right. you know so I got I got lucky and we had you know production designer who does you know major movies and films here and you know Nate my DP was just coming off another feature and a pilot um, so it was kind of like all people that I'd known for a while that if I was just just a dude who asked them to do an indie film they would totally shut me down but right. you know we kind of built the relationship so yeah it was just um, you know a couple months of like you know here's the script what do you think they liked it they had ideas um, and the script the whole time was evolving too so um, yeah it was just same thing it's like I had people I liked a lot that I wanted to work with and as the script evolved and they got more interested and, mm -hmm. and things started happening you know it, it all became a reality that's interesting like you're saying like how so you send them the script and then they, they gave you some feedback what kind of feedback did they get and like, maybe how, how not, did that change the yeah, film not everybody gave me feedback that was like change this but right. you know uh there was definitely, you know, I would be sending the script to these people like, hey, I'm working on this. This is draft right. two. I'm going to write a few more. And uh, yeah, it, it was just like a, a very organic thing where, you know, I'd, I'd meet with my DP and we'd talk about some images and some things and that would kind of spark ideas for, right. oh, this scene could change and become this very subjective, you know, intimate thing that it was before. So you went into it open-minded, like willing to maybe... Yeah, we, we uh, I started, uh, you know, pre-production on draft two or three, and we right. were on draft 14 before we shot. So it was, um, you know, that was that was kind of the the whole intent with this movie was to, you know, to make something organic and to make something that was collaborative. And, yeah, as people had notes, and, and my producer had a bunch of notes, and I sent it to friends and my brother and peers, and, yeah, it was just like... Uh, I, I even wish I'd done that for a couple more weeks, you know, like right. I wish if there was like one or two more drafts, if like a couple of small things would have, would have fixed themselves. But uh, How many people do you think you sent it out to? Um, there was a, I had eight email chains with people that were giving me like constant feedback. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's weird because like everyone's so different that, you know, I, I had, the confusing thing is like when one, one guy says the opposite of another guy. Yeah, so it's all, subjective. You know, yeah, yeah, it's so subjective. So. Yeah. Yeah, not all of it helped. Some of it was good. Some of it was better than others. But definitely, like, I'm very happy that I made an organic evolution right. as opposed to here's the script we're going. Everyone go, you know. But so. that, but that's smart because the audience is made up of people and right. they all have their own opinions. So it's like kind of getting yeah. a test audience. Did you do anything like that? Like get any sort of like feedback from the script before? Yeah, in I, reproduction. Well, I have a writing partner, so there's of course Adam and I. Are yeah. Constantly bouncing back and forth all the time right and then from after that then we just go straight away to our editors okay um, and, and, and they see how they felt about yeah, it and they break down everything with us does it does this work does this sound logical yeah like, can you edit this those kind of you know those kind of things right uh, and then after that um, normally you're bringing in the DP at that point yeah because um, he's got to shoot it all so we start I mean it's not as though we're going to everybody but once you do get on set and then once you have rehearsal like mm -hmm. Rehearsal day, you find out what needs rewritten in that room yeah. too. Right. Yeah. So, of course. Yeah. Uh, and what I like to do when we're on set is get what what has been written several times and then play, you know, those last couple takes anyway. So you're going to find that technically the writing process. So you mean like the, yeah. what, those last couple couple takes are like giving it more freedom? With A little them, bit. Yeah. With, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's story. same same thing for me. Like some of the best best scenes were when you know we gave like very basic direction just let the actors run wild right. and even if it's only a couple lines in the edit a lot of those kind of more organic free flowing you know deliveries are, are what the scene needs to feel like a real scene right yeah that's really cool um, so we're already kind of talking pre-production um, uh, so how did you well it seemed like and I already asked you kind of already answered how did you hire your crew was there anybody new that you might have not have known. It seemed like you guys kind of knew a lot of people through, um, but did was there any new crew, and, and how did you go about finding them and hiring them? I mean, I, I had known everybody. The only person I'd, I'd worked with on a narrative was my DP. So right, okay. for me, it's like, you know, you do your research, and you, you make a list of, these are people that I would like in my film. I've seen their work. I know them as human beings. Um, how do I get them to work with me? So that I think was important because, you know, there's, there's lots of options in, in finding someone who's going to be the right fit. And, you know, there were a couple people that weren't the right fit. And did you ask some of your colleagues or how did you figure out, like, who you were going to, how I mean, did you find those people? Yeah, it's, it's, if you, you know, if you work on a show and that production designer you shake hands with and you look like their work, it's, you know, same, some of their actors, it's like, you know, Carter, our lead, like, 
he was a friend of a friend and I knew his work really well. So I, I did the audition and then our production designer, Amy, I, you know, I'd seen two shows and two movies she'd done. I'd never met her in person, right. um, but we had a friend of a friend. So I reached out and yeah, it's, it's kind of just like people collecting, you know, it's gotcha. like you have to do your research and you have to know who's going to be a good fit. And then you do whatever you can to get them to, to yeah. get on board with you. So that, I mean, that's, um, you know, in those early, early stages of pre-production and getting your department heads, I think, doing your research and being a, you know, inviting and trying to, trying to set something up where you're both happy is, is the most important part. Yeah. So like Jeremy, you kind of talked about a lot of your team, like you, you guys had somehow like known each other. How did that come about? Like, how did you develop uh, that? I never went to film school, oh, but, cool. but, uh, Adam, my uh, co-writer, co-writer co right. uh, on this film did. So... Uh, I, of course, knew him, and I told you about that gallery background. It used to be when they would need um, images or backdrops or anything that might be... It was almost like I was an art department for those guys. Yeah. You know, uh, they would be like, how do we do this? I might be like, well, you could try this, this, or this. Right. And actually make that for them, and it would go in their, their film. So mm -hmm. um, part, of the, part of the crew came through that. But in terms of finding new people, the, all the cast is... That's the thing that's all real new. I feel like my crew is pretty set up and solid. But in terms of bringing new people on, the big hunt was well, casting. It's always casting. For right. Us. So let's talk about casting. What, um, how did you guys treat that? And how did you find your actors? And uh, I'll start with you, Jeremy. Like, um, on the first film, we only cast out of New York. Okay. So it's. Uh, Where did you shoot that film? Was it mean, largely Philadelphia and Coney Island? Okay, so it was pretty close to New York. Mm -hmm. So you you went to the big city with all the actors and. Right, did right. Did you have a casting notice, or how did you, did you have a direct casting director? Uh, on the first film, we actually didn't have a casting director. Okay. So, but there there's so many you know social networking tools for that kind of thing right. anymore that you can you can put out a post and get real talent back pretty quick. Okay. And then uh, go you know take get a room in New York bring people in for 10 minutes, right. go through this this cycle of insanity over and over and over and over. Yeah, over. so how many people did you, you did audition for this film? Um, on the second film, you know, maybe 150 people okay. we looked at yeah. um, in rooms. In, in rooms, so there probably was a, a bunch more submit. Yeah, yeah, so, so the first film was all New York, yeah. and in the second film we were in, uh, we had two casting directors on the on the second feature on the Plays Like Love, so right. we, we had a... Someone out of New York, and we had someone out of Atlanta, mm -hmm. and so then I was in rooms in New York and Atlanta, and then I would go and set up some rooms in LA and be out there for, for like. Uh, uh, so you cast in LA also. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the second film, uh, Claire Delamore comes out of LA, um, and then we get uh, Joshua Mickle out of Atlanta and John Schmieds out of Atlanta, and then the rest right. of the cast is out of New York, Philadelphia. Yeah. So how did and how did you even cast in Atlanta? Did they submit through the New York? Location. Uh, we we went. Uh, our casting director down here was Jeff Ross. Oh, okay, okay. So you had, you you were connected with a casting director, and this they okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and what about you? I mean, I, I mine was a little more a bit. little more piecemeal. Yeah, it was. Um, so it was a lot of friends of friends. Um, I cast probably a quarter of the movie with people I worked with before. I found Carter and Sydney our lead male and lead female. Um, through friends at AFI, and Carter has a, a huge resume with big movies, and there's a couple other people that were in the AFI community that I was looking at too. Um, so they were. Uh, and how are you involved with AFI? Uh, my DP. That? So AFI is the American Film Institute. It's mm -hmm. you know it's um, it's it's like one of the, the film schools. It's it's kind of run differently than most film schools, and it's got kind of prestige, especially for cinematography. Right. Um, so all the professors there are. Uh, you know they've they've all done TV and movies, so a lot of times they'll get their friends to come in and work with the students, right. and that was the case with my DP Nate and Carter. So Nate, at his projects at AFI, his grad program, had worked with a few dozen name actors. Right. Um, you know, just because the professors would bring them in and say, "Hey, do you want to work on a student project?" And um, so yeah, it's just like a really weird string of connections. Right. And, uh, and yeah, it's I've actually used two of their DPs from AFI for music videos and commercials, and gotcha. they have a nice a nice pedigree built there. But yeah, so and then you know Jake the Snake, uh, he saw him there. He's an ex pro wrestler that I knew of, and um, he was a friend of a friend. And then you you cast Jason and one or two others for us as, as well as some of the extras. And then our production coordinator had a friend who wanted to do extras casting who got our extras. 
So it was very like all over the place and scatterbrained casting, but we ended up with a pretty solid yeah. you know, group of people. Right. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, we borrowed your theater for some of the additions. They had some of the additions <laughs> at my house. Yeah. It, was, it was a little, it was a crazy one. Um, yeah. um, so let's talk about, we talked a little bit about um, revisions, the script revisions. But, uh, but in talking about, I think what's interesting is, you know, uh, your film is, is more, I would, you know, say more of a drama, mm -hmm. you know, like psychological drama, and you get this comedy. Um, how did you, um, you know, how, how was the revision process? We talked a little bit about that already, but was there any, you know, did it change um, later in the process? Uh, the screenplay? Like maybe after casting? I think... Um we went into pre-production on the right. second film right after Locomotive. I really pushed to do that. And so uh, I think we were constantly writing. Right. And maybe we, almost to the point where uh, you're, we were rewriting a little bit. Right. Um, not quite slipping notes underneath doors yeah. the morning of kind of thing, but right. you know, a few hours back off of that kind of thing. So it was a constant uh, rewrite process on the second film, and which is why there's been a bit of a gap Mm -hmm. After the after that, so that we have much more pre-production time for all the next projects, yeah, and then can get ahead of those kind of things. Yeah, gotcha. Did you find like did you change anything after casting, Donna? Oh me? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, with uh, especially with characters like the guy who played Jed, Jake the Snake. Is you know he is a he went from being written as this kind of like very manipulative <coughs> and very um, almost preacher like character to, you know, we had an ex-pro wrestler who's not an actor who didn't want to memorize lines and yeah, so the couple of days beforehand, very, very much tweaks and then as we shot, it obviously evolved a lot. Um, yeah, and then I mean, you know, just on the whole, we, we did a lot of improvising and a lot of experimenting on set mm -hmm. that I feel like added way more to the script than I would have ever thought while writing it. Um, so that's, that's been yeah. a big stylistic change, especially moving forward from that. The last two years, I do a lot more organic blocking and a lot more uh, table reads. And right. you know, when I'm writing music videos, I, I really capitalize on the the kind of like off the cuff organic scenes and, and right. trying to surprise the actors, which is um, How, like, what is an example? How would you surprise an actor in a scene? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's my favorite thing to do, especially with non-actors, is give one character uh, a lot of direction uh, or specific actions, and then gotcha. let the other one have to discover what's happening in that moment yeah okay. so in music videos are lucky because you don't have a script so you know I'll do a 30 or 45 minute take for a lot of things and really yeah so that's like <laughs> no seriously it's, it's like the the best thing so I've done a couple like lifestyle music videos and when you get to like the really organic stuff it's it's usually when you know the camera has been on for 40 minutes and it goes from the stage of we're doing what's scripted to what do we do to alright we're exploring to okay this is happening and they kind of they find the things that that are, are natural for them. Um, so we only did that once or twice in terms of that long scene with heavy water. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, so I mean, to answer the question, yes, it yes, evolved a, a lot. <laughs> yeah. So um, how did you determine your budget? Let's talk a little bit about it, that whole thing, <laughs> the financing. Uh, but how did you, de you guys determine the budget and you know, how did you go about finding the budget? What was or, the or finding the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the money to shoot it. It was in my bank account. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. But did you, so, so that's, that was your budget? You were like, I uh, this, I'm going to Yeah, we went over budget, and I took out a loan. I sold my camera and my lenses, which was heartbreaking. But, uh, you know, it's like the, the traditional, I maxed out two credit cards and spent everything in my bank account, and then borrowed $5,000 from my dad and paid them back later kind of thing. Right. So it's, it was very much like, you know. So you um, were like, this is how much I have. I'm yeah. gonna stick within this budget. I, yeah, did I did. You, did you write around that? No. Um, okay. My my thought going into it was, I believe that if you have enough prep time, and you have the right crew and the right favors, and that was what I'm I'm good at in the the Atlanta scene is like there's a lot of favors you can get. Like we just Alex Orr's the local producer, and he hooked us up with like what would have been a twenty thousand dollar light package for free. You know, we got two red cameras for free. So it's I I felt like part of the challenge for me was like 
being able to call on every possible favor. And well, yeah, see. but it's almost not free. It's a favor, though, right? You've done sort of. Well, I've done, you know, the, the yeah. years prior, like, you know, uh, one of our... Uh, so Amy uh, Holmberg, who I serve as my production designer, I've right. done visual effects on a film she worked on for free, which is how right. I knew her. It was a short film that she really wanted to set extensions to stuff on, so she already felt like she owed me a favor. And then, you know, I'd spent years doing free projects and, and, and working on stuff with their people, so it wasn't like it was like a one-way, like asking it was you know it was like hey alex you know how i did the visual effects for this small thing would it be cool if we borrowed some lights from your show and you know our camera guys both of them were owner operators of their reds and they were both guys i'd gotten a lot of work for and i brought on the paying gigs and you yeah. know they knew that the favor wouldn't go on returns and and we did pay people like it wasn't there was no one that was working for free right but right. they were all working for super, Low, super lower cheap. than their standard rate. Right? yeah exactly i mean i you know and that's kind of how we we started working together too. I mean, I, you helped me shoot a couple of things, shorts, and yeah. you know, and I and I was like just really grateful to you know help you and learn about the, with the casting and process. But but what what about you? So how did you determine the budget uh, of the film and break down the script or whatever? And then you know how did you guys raise that money? Uh, I I think before there's a budget, there's there's an insane commitment to doing a project. Right. Right. And so then that that'll allow you to work around different things. So mm -hmm. um, if something, you know, if something somewhere costs $10,000, let's say you were to price something out like that, right. somewhere there's someone entering the, the industry who has that talent or that piece who right. is interested in working on a high quality project. Right. So we're, we're, we're writing centric first. So if you have good material, you can tend to pull people towards you. Yeah. Right. Um, once, once you have a team that's built up, then you start to pull resources based off that. Uh, then we would find uh, independent producers, um, yeah. as many as you can. We did a small Kickstarters, um, neither, neither of which was enough, yeah. Yeah. really. Yeah. We actually went over budget and had to do a Kickstarter after the fact mm. for a post. So we raised like twenty five grand to cover right. our, our losses. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and going off your point, yeah, it's... Um, you know, it wasn't like a, the greatest script, but a lot of the, the people that crewed on this were like, you know, early 20s, never worked on a feature and liked the idea. And, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily a favor so much as they really wanted to work on a movie and they were asking constantly, how do we do that? And this was right. an opportunity for them. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, if you have a good idea and you have people that like the script, that's the, the easiest way to get people to help. Right. Yeah. So what was, um, and if you don't mind sharing, what was the budget of the film? Uh, I can tell you the public Kickstarter number of the second yeah. film was eleven thousand. <laughs> for the for the feature of the second, which is an insane number to do a feature at. Yeah, that's so low. When, so especially when you look at um, uh, the film itself. They, yeah, yeah. We shot I, on I'm Sony like X. Uh, <laughs> shot on the F sixty five, which mm -hmm. which is a, a great camera yeah, that, yeah, that they, Tom Cruise uses for like oblivion. Right. Um, small indie light package. Uh, Plus duct tape. So where did all the money? Where did, that, that's the thing. Is like where did the budget go to? I mean, if it was eleven thousand, it probably went to your food budget. Yeah, it's like food. <laughs> but actually, that's an interesting thing. Like where did it go? You find out that most indies don't take care of the the cast and crew's basic. So most things for us right up front goes towards um, food and lodging right away. Right. So just like to keep the army alive, mm -hmm. that happens first, and then then everything else you just figure out. You know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Werner Herzog, so I grew up watching like all those documentaries, right. or even something like uh, Werner Herzog eats his own yeah. shoe, where they ask him like, well, how did, Earl, how did Earl Morris make this documentary? How do you make your films? And even back then, he's like, just go get a camera. So most of the things that that we spend money on in, in film, right. those things don't cost what they used to. So it's it's easier to get all the technical tools. You so need. Do, so do you feel like most of your budget went to to technical or to other places it went towards yeah food lodging travel and, and travel gotcha yeah, to move those things around right and 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 what about you Donna? yeah uh you know i went into it you know i'd worked on a bunch of indie movies before that and i hated the way they treated cast and crew so i was very adamant about paying everyone right uh, except for a couple of pas that were literally like 17 year old kids yeah right that they but did, uh, yeah yeah you, but you were giving them an all the all the people that were already working in the industry paid um and then, you know, we had some big set pieces, so art sucked up majority of it, and, um, and yeah, you know, it was, so most of it was food, accommodate, not 
you know, we didn't have hotels. Everyone was local except for uh, the lead actor and his girlfriend. But um, so most of it was kind of set operation, basic right. food. And then art department was the next biggest cost. And that was kind of equal to paying everyone. Right. So, um, yeah, those are the expenses. And we did a, a $25,000 Kickstarter and got a couple thousand beyond what we asked for. Um, and then, you know, yeah. um, you know the, the exact number is very gray area because there's so many expenses. It's there. probably changing still. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like yeah. Festivals. But, you know, we kept it SAG ultra low budget, right. which is, you know, uh, we didn't spend anything close to what it could have cost us. Right. So how did you, even even with the $11,000 budget, how did you guys go about raising that money? Or was it somebody's already? Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's all good. that's all small Sorry. Kickstarter donations. Oh, oh that, that $11,000 was Kickstarter? Yeah, it, wow. it, of what's out there. I mean, that's, that's really what we built. I mean, the funny story is when we did the first film, Locomotive, right. we were already filming, and then about two weeks in, we were like, should we get a budget for this? Should we go get money? Because we were... The first film so different than the second one. Right, yeah. And we always talk about it that way. Locomotive's yeah. this kitchen sink documentary style thing, so you can do anything you want with that, right? Right. You can shoot on a Canon 5D. Sure. You know, you can go out with like sulfur lights on the walls and, and pick anything up, no problem. Right. And so we were already filming that, and then we're like, oh yeah, yeah budget. We need, <laughs> we need a budget. What do I? What are we? You know, how do you do those things? Because that was we were coming from a really real indie background. Yeah, of you course. Know? Um, and then on the second one, it was like, well, let's just double that. Mm -hmm. that's, where just, that that's where that number comes let's from. Let's just double it. <laughs> yeah, we were like, yeah. let's double that number, which is not enough. Right. Like, right. But, but because we were producing the film, we were able to get it done. Yeah, yeah that's what I was wondering. Did you find, and you just said it wasn't enough. Is that, well, did you find that that was the case? Your budget became enough, or did you go over? No, you, you, keep, it, you keep it there, and then you become really creative. Okay. Like, I was and saying, how would you do that? Like, if something, um, if something cost, like I said, ten thousand dollars. Right. Find the person who will do it for ten dollars. Make sure they're good at it. Right. Of but you know, what sets that industry standard is like, if you're not working in that industry, if your indie is in yeah. true indie is really outside the bounds of all that stuff. Right. So just don't spend ten thousand dollars on that. If someone, you know, if a member of my team comes to me and they go, Jeremy. We can do this for X number of dollars. I was like, well, we don't have X number of dollars for that. We have this. So that's what we need to do that thing for. Or right. this thing has to become something entirely yeah. different. Yeah, you guys had some pretty sweet locations. You know, I noticed, um, like, awesome. You guys had this big theater. Um, and you you had, like, the, what was it? The, it we used, like, the, the Pullman Yard. The Pullman Yard, which is right around. Ben Opera House. Yeah, right. Pretty much all of East Atlanta. How did you guys, so how did you... Fine. And were you guys a part of the scout process? Uh, were, you, were you? I, I think you were. Or was, how did you yeah. find your locations? And um, and then how did you go about sort of, you know, getting them uh, for, for your films? For us, another reason that we sort of pushed into the second film so fast and making it was because the location opened up. Okay. The theater opened up. There was this time. So then we had our window, and then it was just heading towards it. To make did sure you have to? Pay, did you have to pay for it, or how did that? I mean, happen? yeah, you have to. There's all sorts of different locations, different things, different contracts, different right. talking to different people. Twenty meetings for this place, no meetings for that. <laughs> yeah. um, it, the first film's maybe an even better example because we were filming in New York and Philadelphia. Right. So we would go into New York bars and we'd be like, "Hey, we'd like to rent this back space," and their their manager wouldn't even get back to us. Oh yeah. We'd like to pay to rent time. this back space. Right. And then we were in Philadelphia and we'd walk into a space and we're like. Uh, we need a space and they'd be like great you can have the second floor of our bar all day Saturday we'll turn off all the music downstairs for you free great go yeah so that's I mean we were looking for the same location we needed like a bar location and New York wasn't helpful Philadelphia was very like yeah great you, to the point where you get like big emails that were like oh this is what people should do right. they should make art you know like huge statements and you're like oh look at you know so how many people do you think you had to call up to get that location, or, or did it just work? like a, the bar, for example, yeah. Philadelphia? <laughs> it was as simple yeah. as walking down the street, and walking in the bar, and saying, "Hello, this is right. who we are. Mm -hmm. Who do we who do we talk to about this thing?" Yeah. And then sometimes you leave an e email with them. Sometimes they talk to you right there. Right. What about we had we had similar experiences some places. Um, you know, uh, I think some of our cheapest locations were our best ones. Uh, the abandoned opera house that we built that giant set in, you know, is this uh, 
it had a sign on the wall that said call to lease and we called this guy who didn't speak any English and like hounded him for three and a half weeks and right. so we eventually got him to meet and then I don't even know if he knows what we you know what happened but like <laughs> it was right. the kind of situation where he was like yeah you know two thousand dollars for two weeks that's fine so that was a you know that was a cost but it's like compared to what you'd pay you know it was a it was an opera house you right know? it was in the middle of East Atlanta Village um, that had like you know enough parking in the background for it was it was like pretty ideal right um, so you know that that was one and then we had you know some of our most expensive locations were when shit hit the fan on set and it's like a, a location goes down we lost it you know we have this actor in town for a day and then we have to shoot right you know, so, so you had to find some yeah we had, to, we had to blow a grand on uh, that elementary school even though it was like very you know it's that should be the easiest one to get, and we had one, and everything was fine. And then, you know, last minute, it's like, uh oh. How so? How well? That probably is personal, but like, you know, how did like so that how did that end up happening? You lost the location, and then you yeah you, you were able to find one. Well, actually, yeah. So we lost two or three locations, right. and you know, you actually were part of part of that crime. But you remember, we were like the very last minute, like, hey, we lost a location grant. Right. We shoot at the place where your office at the is. Theater, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So we you had a theater at the time, looked kind of like a school on the right. outside for part of it. Yeah. Uh, and then that fell through with their owners because oh, yeah. they got yeah, mad. They so yeah, it was like, you know, sometimes you scramble uh, and then Pullman Yard we stole. You know, we literally, you know, we, we hopped the fence with uh, a skeleton crew and oh, shot man. the date scene. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, and then there are certain ones where, you know, you, you get a very standard price and Atlanta has a lot of industry and they're used to, you know, this bar, this restaurant, this house has a very standard, like this is what you need to pay. And because they're used to having shows shoot there. Right. Uh, and then we did Airbnb for any house locations. Right, yeah, you so told you me about like that. You were like, bucks. this Airbnb thing is legit. Try yeah. that out yeah, for yeah. your next film. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And yeah, and they're usually Airbnb, It's they have like a $75 a night for this house. And right. like, hey, was it cool if we shoot a little, little movie in there? And they're like, yeah, no problem. So right. that was that's awesome because it's like a location scout of homes for you because you have thousands of photos and thousands of options and it's like right. it's amazing for home locations. So so um, uh, Jeremy, you mentioned you like had a like a background in fine arts, if you will. Um, did you storyboard your film at all, or did you draw up stuff, or did you just yeah, really I shot mean, this? How did it, because how did it's do that? because it's on the stage, so there would be set designs for the theater right. uh, there would be a few storyboards but um, most of that stuff once once we were filming because we were filming a yeah. lot so quickly a lot of that came down to just uh, a discussion between myself Nathan and Adam uh, and who's the, the DP the DP yeah right and so you're you're changing things around even which is what you would do even if you had hard hard boards for the right yeah you, you would need to be flexible because the space is slightly different because the light setup is slightly different right so once you get so you went in it with an idea, like maybe a shot list, and then got in the space and kind of adapted? And then exactly, yeah. Gotcha. And what about you, Donna? Did you Very similar. Yeah, we, we shot listed the whole movie, um, but you know we stayed true to it maybe half the time, and that was just because spaces were different than we expected. Right. You know, we'd, we'd find an image we liked a lot based on a natural light source, and that would change the way things are done. And then, you know, I, I organically blocked all the scenes, so if I planned for just a quick shot or a shot, and then they end up, you know, moving around a lot, right. and, you know, you pick your points where you want the conversation interaction to happen, sometimes that's, an, you know... But I know, I know, you're like, I know you, you're like a, you're kind of a planner in a good way, but so yeah. did you already have some of that blocking and, and editing in mind, or, or did you kind of figure that out? Well, I moment? planned for naturalism, so right. that was, the you know, and... If I did the film again, I think I could make it even more natural and feel a lot more organic. But, you know, for what I knew at the time, that was... How do you plan for naturalism? Uh, you know, I do a beat sheet of the whole script, too, which right. is I go through and every single beat of the character, you know, I, I put the, the verb, the action, what their objective is, what they're trying to get. So, you know, if you have a scene and you're like, well, this guy, you know, he wants to learn more about this girl. Right. How does that happen? So we had that scene where... You know, he's working in his yard and yeah. she comes across. Initially, that was going to be a shot of her shot of the fence, but I realized that if he's trying to kind of be a showman and if he's trying to kind of be very charismatic, right. he would need to open up a lot more. So, on the day, you know, I had some exercises for them where, you know, we would do a couple pieces without lines and, you know, I would, you know, a couple scenes where it's like, you know, you have to have her eye contact at all times and a couple ones where, you know, we would make it really difficult for him where we'd have to. You know, if we're looking at his 
shots from her perspective, I would make it so that, you know, I was like, don't give him the time of day. Don't let him have any attention from you. You want to get to work. Don't give a shit about him. Right. And that would, you know, that would cause the impetus for, you know, Carter to really, really try hard. Um, and kind of after a couple of different attempts in different ways, we kind of found what felt natural, which was, you know, him starting big and getting smaller and they get closer and then they kind of taper off as she leaves. So that, that then made for three different sets of shot reverse shot. One that was kind of far away, where right. they didn't know who each other were. One where he was kind of closer to her, trying to get her attention. And one where, you know, he realized it was not gonna happen because she had to go to work, where he kind of lets off. So we had, you know, three different beats that took place at three different lengths away from each other because he was in the middle, you know, he was working on the yard the whole time. Right. So yeah, it's, you know, you can't always plan for it and sometimes you discover it in the day, but um, we shot us the whole thing. I beat you the whole thing, and then whenever we got to a place, I tried to find a way to make it more impromptu. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. What about you? Um, you? So we kind of talked about like sort of um, we were talking about storyboarding, but what up, what about working with the actors, uh, Jeremy? Like, how did you treat that process? Well, our audition for a place like Love specifically was someone would walk in the room. You'd give them the sheet right there. Right go through it and then mm -hmm. immediately offer some kind of change right. have them do it again so it felt like theater because we were doing a film about theater right and I needed to see that people would be flexible and play around mm -hmm. with that and then once you're on set um, we you, you know you do rehearsals you have that uh, and you get in the space you block it out right um, you go through it and then if it's not working you change it again but it's normally um, I mean our sets are pretty Pretty quiet, pretty friendly, yeah. pretty. And that's a, <laughs> yeah. one, of, one of the things that, that, because I did not come from a film school background, so when I first right. saw that, it's kind of like a, it could almost be construed as a weird passive aggressive environment, but it's actually not. The whole thing is so toned down so that everyone can interact. So it's like, I'm just going to need you to go over there and do that. And you're like, oh yeah, thanks for talking to me that way, as opposed to, you know, anything yeah, else. So, yeah. so. I've, on set, yeah. those are the kind of like corrections you do in between. How how big was your crew, really quick? Like uh, like on, on a typical set day, um, Jeremy. There. Oh, Jeremy. Go, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Mister, go ahead, Mister Donahoe. Either so, one. I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it it bounced up and down quite a bit. Um, so you know, on our biggest days where we had extras yeah. and we had to light the entire inside of the opera house. Yeah. You know, that was like the all hands on deck day and we'd have that was like, a big day, I remember that. Yeah, we'd have like thirty or forty people right. and then like I said with the Pullman Yard, that was a day where we we literally had myself, the D P and then a camera assistant and the two actors. Right. So, you know, it was again, because also when you don't have lots of money trying to and you're paying everyone, you know, I actually scheduled the days like, all right, we can cut five crew members here, but we need everybody this day and this right. is a pre light day. So that we don't have crew that day. So yeah, it was very much up and down. Um, we probably averaged fifteen to twenty, and then you know, forty on the big days, and three or four on the small days. Right. And, and what about you? I'd I'd say some somewhere in the same range. I mean, in the smaller shots, let's say I'm in a bathroom, shooting something small like that. Right. We maybe only have five six people working then. Right. And then up to you know twenty five if we're on a big set day where the theater stage needs to go up and down and move around and the lighting's gotta change. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk about, um, let's talk about, like, what, what did you guys shoot on? What, what camera? For this film, it was all uh, Sony F65. Okay. And had you worked with a camera before? Or? It was the first time using this camera. Okay. And it's very... And how did that, like, how did that selection process come about? Like, what, you know... Well, Why look, did you guys choose You that look at camera? what's available and then you look at um, sort of image quality. I guess the thing with digital, and especially the time, because you're looking two years ago now, right. you tend to look at image integrity. So you look, to look at like, you know, blacks and, uh, you know, color. What does it do to those two things? Right. Actually shooting on those kind of things. Um, but most of these are so versatile now that you, you basically are looking for something with the biggest back end, really, right? The biggest depth. Which what is do, the what do you mean? Like, like, a, like the Kodak or what do you mean? Yeah, you're looking for something that you'll be able to push color, right, push, push the range, color, close, right. which is very different than shooting on locomotive, which was all Canon 5Ds. I mean, there's no range on that camera. Yeah. Like, right. what you shoot is what's going to so be... So you guys were planning maybe a more, a deeper color correction process, so you wanted a camera that can a proper, that. Uh, Yeah, a proper process for this, a right. different look. Uh, the first more film... More cinematic. When, when I look back at locomotive, I wish we had even maybe 
degraded it more, you know, like ran it through a VHS, taped it off a VHS on another VHS, just watch it degrade, 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 and have this kind of look. Um, right. And maybe we'll go back to it in a year or two and do do a special version. Add, add a new look. Yeah. So what, what about you? So what did you shoot on? Uh, we shot on, we did a two camera setup for everything. It was right. an MX, a red MX and a red Scarlet. Um, and yeah, same thing. It's like you want your skin tones to look human. You know, you want enough color space that, you know, if there's mismatched lights, you can correct it. And, you know, it's, I but, think. But I've noticed like a lot of people, like red is a really popular independent indie film making camera. I'd say only, it's, it's getting less popular now that the Amir is out um, right. and that there's a lot of more options. But mm -hmm. yeah, you know, the last like 10 years, it's been the cheap option to have a raw Kodak on a 35 millimeter sensor. And, you know, like, you know, Red MX, you can buy one now for like right. three grand. <laughs> right. Um, so at the time, it was like, what's the cheapest option that will give us good skin tones, nice color, uh, and yeah, a raw back end where if we need to tweak things or, you know, cheap scenes, we can do that. And I was like, and actually, and you got a lot of compliments on this too, your color correction process for heavy water. I thought that yeah. was really cool. So did you, did you have that like already in mind? Is that why you wanted to shoot? I mean, you, you owned like an FS700. Why did you go to the red? Uh, FS700 I liked a lot, but yeah, it, the issue with it honestly was, was skin tones and color. It, okay. it was an 8-bit codec versus a raw codec. Right. So um, Did you shoot in raw? We did, yeah. Okay. yeah everything was red raw. Um, and yeah, it's 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 the small difference. You know, it's like the last two percent that most people don't give a shit about. And right. you can shoot a great movie on a five D, but yeah, uh, totally. yeah, it's it's just for us. It was like we want to push it as far as we can. And you know, the color correction. Uh, I wanted something really really dim and really filmic right. and really really um, you know gritty feeling. Right. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it definitely felt that way. Yeah. So it's you know I because I come from visual effect. I'm actually the the color on this is like. There was a lot of things that kind of got lost in translation, and a lot of things I would love to go back and fix. Um, but we're, you know, and I probably will if we ever get distribution. But um, I definitely, I, I've had um, thirty-five millimeter film stock grain plates I like to use. Um, I have a couple of LUTs I built myself. Uh, Did you build this yourself? This mm -hmm. LUT? Yeah, 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 and yeah, it's it's not super hard. It's one I use for a lot of stuff, but. Um, there's a lot of balancing stuff that could be done to make it nicer, but right. yeah, overall it's like. I wanted this film grain, I wanted this LUT, I wanted this not So you were the visual. colorist on this film? Yeah. Okay. That's cool. And, you, and um, so what about like, uh, like you know, lenses and that sort of thing? Did I noticed you like finished yours kind of in the letterbox, the anamorphic look, mm -hmm. which is kind of popular. Why did, why did, um, and I like that look too, I don't even really know, I couldn't answer this question for it, but why, yeah. why are more filmmakers going that? And did you actually shoot with anamorphic lenses? Uh, no, that was you, Donna. Oh, me. Because yeah. it, it wasn't like... Sorry, everyone. dude. No, you're fine. Um, <laughs> you're, yeah, you're good at looking at both of us at the same time. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we didn't shoot anamorphic. I shoot a lot of projects anamorphic now. Right. Um, but I, I don't like when you letterbox after the fact or just because you can. Um, I actually just like the wider viewing angle. I like right. being able to compose things on a rectangle versus something... You know, 60 by 9 is great, but um, especially in you know, theater projection, being able to have the full spread, I feel like it covers, you know, what you see as a human more, because you see a lot of left and right. right. So if you have a four by three or 16 by nine image, you know, I feel like you're just not getting all the bang for your buck out of, you know, your image compositions. Um, and, you know, it's, it's different for every project too. I wanted to, you know, if it was like a small intimate character piece and, and, I might go 60 by 9, but this I wanted to feel large and, you know, we, we wanted to build kind of a landscape and we wanted to build a world and, right. you know, I wanted to be able to show as much of that as possible. Right. So I just felt that, you know, uh, 235 had a nicer aspect for composing the kind of shots I wanted. Um, and, and yeah, you, we you obviously, you had that in mind beforehand? Or yes, right yes, yes. If you do it afterwards, you're you know. You're screwed. <laughs> yeah, well, not, not screwed. It's just like we wanted every image to be composed right. and have proper headroom. And, right, yeah, absolutely. You know, everything feel like a photograph. So, yeah. you know, we had a letterbox on our cameras going in. Yeah, so yeah. that it, it wasn't just like an after afterthought. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then, uh, you know, next movie, hopefully it can shoot real anamorphic. It's more expensive for sure, but it's um, it's a really fun way way to shoot because it basically doubles your sensor size and you just get so much depth 
uh, it's yeah. kind of compressed in that it just makes all your images feel a lot more close. It's great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so like, was were you part of that, like, in the selection process of the lenses, or did you even care? I mean, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a, yeah. I think you have to care. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, but directors don't. But, but for it, for yeah. us, it's a, it was a big this film, especially because we were moving so quickly. It was a right. big conversation with the cinematographer. Uh huh. Um, and just if you work with talented people, they they're gonna have suggestions. Sure. And uh, and you. They, if they're talented enough, you, you listen to what they have to say. Yeah, sure. But but in terms of like m- seeing more and more stuff that way, like just the anamorphic. If your question is why, I mean, it's just film, right? Yeah, it's but you like didn't. But you guys shot sixty nine. We did, but if you right. if you if you can go bigger, if you can afford to make the biggest thing, if you could do what Quentin Tarantino just did, shooting seventy yeah. millimeter, and then retrofitting all the all the theaters to play that image, why wouldn't you? Well, I mean, it's seventy millimeter anamorphic. Yeah, it's yeah. so amazing. It's I can't so wait. <laughs> We're like IMAX, you know what what they talk right. about IMAX is. What it's doing is you're going, it's not like two times the image, it's eight times the image size. So it, what he was saying is it's filling your visual field. So okay. if you want to be filmic, if you want to make you know, big screen stuff like that, that's, that's where that comes from. It's just going to give you... Right. Yeah. You so how, did you guys, like, how did you guys choose your lenses? And what was like, I don't know, did you find that that was part of your look of the film? or uh, for, On this film, Nathan is tracking light and lenses, and I'm right. tracking composition. Gotcha. And and act like the the actors themselves. So for right, you, yeah. you asked earlier about my storyboard process. So yeah, yeah, yeah. In the film, there's a shot of Josh up mm-hmm. on the roof looking for cell reception. So I drew that. Okay. Exactly as it is with the treetops, the the slice of the roof, and a guy holding the cool. the thing. So we know what it is. We get him up there, and then um, then Nathan makes recommendations. Adam and I have discussion, and then you make the best choice for that scene. Right, awesome. On that day, in that light, yeah. with the time, you know, all those things. And so, uh, what about like as far as lighting? Because I, I think that's a big part of filmmaking. Um, and I noticed, even in just that scene that we showed, there was really interesting light, you know, um, in the theater. But uh, how did, did, were you a part of that, that process of, uh, I'm sure you were, and how did you guys make, like what kind of lighting package did you use? What did you... How did you um, direct um, that process? That was a discussion, again, between Nate, because he's going to shoot it, so he's, right. he's going to have everything he needs. Yeah. So uh, we, we built the kit together. Um, and then we also brought in uh, a theater, someone who works in theater, Amy, Amy Lux, who's, her right. job is to light that. Now, then there's interesting discussions you're having, because there's a huge difference between theater light and film light. Oh, right. right. So now that's happening on set. You know, like, yeah. let's do this. Well, that won't, that won't read, so what can you do? So... Um, she was great for um, certain sequences where we're projecting a huge amount of light behind them. Right. She knows how to set that up. And there's a discussion with, with Nathan about what's going to work mm-hmm. in that space. But it, that's also going back to basic images. If you're boarding, you're also, when you're boarding, you're planning all these things, right? You're thinking about the light. Right. You're thinking about the actor in the space. You're thinking about a lens to some degree, right? Yeah. You've got to know the depth and the placement sure. of the character and things like that. Yeah. So you were. Th- did you have that in mind as you go into it with some? There's um, there's certain there's certain things for sure that are in your mind. So yeah. someone's framing it out, and you're like, no, 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 that's not how it is. For example, there you'll see there's almost no brick in the film in the background, even though there's brick in some of these buildings. This makes me think of that because yeah. Nathan was like, oh man, you hate brick, because anytime we catch a corner of it, I'd be like, no, it's just what it does is I'd rather have a flat behind somebody because then their right. face is going to be as opposed to a. A pattern behind someone's head. Right. Yeah. So there, there are basic rules like that 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 you have, you know, as you go through, and you're like, yeah. we have to swing it this way because of this thing. Yeah. And so you already kind of maybe go, going just with your with your arts background, you already had that in mind, or did you learn by trial and error that oh, brick is shitty against skin tones? So <laughs> how did you figure that out? I, I, yeah, I guess I guess that's subconscious. Like, really? You just you just didn't like that look, or is it? Well, like, I mean, it's an interesting thing. I don't know. He's like. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you don't know. Yeah. What about you, Don? Donna? Is there? Did you go into it any with any like lighting? This, yeah, this yeah. Event? No, uh, Nate and I worked together, and again, it's because of I have a visual background. There's a lot of things I have very strong preferences for that I really shouldn't have until <laughs> I have money. You know what I mean? So lensing is one of those things where it's like, a, uh, you know, I I'm like a hobbyist lens technician where I you know before the movie I had a set of Lomo lenses that I I bought from Russia and modified myself and. I really, really like the different character they all have. So it was important for us to, you know, spend a little bit of money on a decent package. So we got um, P2 
PC Me in town actually gave us an amazing deal uh, where they gave us a set of Zyde Super Speeds for, um, I think it was like for the 21 days, it was like $800. So that's like an unheard of price yeah. for <laughs> for that that package. Um, and then, yeah, the uh, the reason we went with Super Speeds versus like uh, the Cooks or something that I like a lot too is because um, for all of the lighting, you know, Nate and I both, we love super, super natural, giant, soft sources. Um, you know, we want it to feel like you're not ever sure where the light's coming from, you know, and it's always motivated by something that's a practical on set. So, you know, because um, we don't ever want to feel like a documentary necessarily, but we definitely don't want it to feel um, obvious or, you know, we, we want all of our lighting choices to be subtle. Mm -hmm. um, so to have giant soft sources, you know, it requires a lot of light because there's a lot of diffusion. Um, so we had to have faster lenses and we wanted the movie to be dim. So we shot a lot of stuff like at night so yeah it was it was kind of like all the puzzle pieces like how do we get you know large soft sources um and very naturalistic stuff using a lot of practicals and it's like well we need faster lenses and you know we always we almost always push the uh, the iso of the camera a lot higher than you know you would for most movies because we kind of liked the the texture and the grit of it so, right yeah yeah and it was more important for us to have something that felt soft and natural than it was for so us so what was it that, like with, with the red was it 800 or 1600? uh the red yeah the red's native is 800 but we were almost always at 1600 right okay yeah. so then so you what were you how are you treating lighting if you were getting these big soft sources especially like on a low budget yeah, did, were you just what kind of package did you have? Well, like I said, we so, got we I mean, got a really got... nice package from okay, okay. or for cheap. Right. So like you know, uh, the kind of default was like we'd have a, a tungsten um, practical, and then we would uh, so like a know, butterfly or something. <laughs> no, like we we had like a lamp and and shot okay. that we motivated the light from, and then we would put like a giant twenty by source with a maxi brew behind it, um, and then we also had a, a reefa we always float around, which is a, a big soft light. Right. Um, so yeah, and I, I don't like edge lighting. I don't like you know anything where you overplay it in the actor's eyes unless it's motivated. So um, it was always kind of like we we build our scene um, in terms of the the aesthetic around the practical sources that are there, where light would be coming from in the real world. You know, is it lit by lamp? Is there a far off light? Is it street lit? And then we kind of place our sources in a way that you know, kind of mocked where that light would be coming from and made as natural as possible and as integrated as possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So um we talked we did talk about working with actors. What about working with uh um uh, well, what were some challenges? That's a good question. What were some challenges that might have come up during the production process? Um that, you know, maybe it's been some lessons learned and <laughs> I mean it's isn't it it's all challenging. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right, yeah, like every day, huh? <laughs> it, that's what it is, right? It's a it's a it's a daily list of challenges, right? That you just go down the checklist all day. So how do you how do you handle that as a director? Uh, th this one was is so different than the first because we would we would film all day, uh, and then I kept everybody in that my closest crew anyway right. in one house together. So then we would go home at night, and then it's almost like you just have a, a meeting. Right. until you can't see and you go to sleep yeah. and then you wake up and that's in your head and then you go off and shoot again so I, it's just a constant set of challenges but luckily because I work with everybody I like it's sort of the, it's like the best environment to get that that kind of press under so everybody sort of already went into it with that idea we're going to have challenges we're going to you know we're going to troubleshoot as we go so that that did it did it, it was it, you said it, it seemed like a pretty relaxed set for the most part I mean, it seems yeah. like a, like, I guess what I was trying to say about film set yeah. etiquette is, right. is to give the veneer of the, of the relaxed. Right. I think that's where that... At least that, attempt it. <laughs> right? Right. Because what do you have? You either have that or you have the, the yeah. archetype of the screaming person. The screaming which director. Doesn't, which doesn't work. Right. It's, you know, it's hard to yell at someone and be like, go to your most vulnerable place now. Right. Unless your most vulnerable place is somewhere where you get yelled at. Yeah, sure. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, we had challenges for sure. Um, we uh, we had a lot of like fighting the gods moments. We uh, you know Atlanta was in a drought for like five years, and the uh, the twenty days we shot were the the end of the drought. <laughs> that was right. the uh, two summers ago. I don't even remember. There was like literally a thirty day period where you know nine percent of the time it was raining. Right. That was when we shot our movie. So you know it was mostly exteriors and at night. Um, so that was a challenge in itself. And then, you know, everything from like, you know, we were shooting 
and poor places and you know things would just appear off set and cars would get broken into and because we had a movie that was almost all on location and places that were supposed to feel like totally dirty and run down you know those those things existed too you know we had people that um you know that we in this abandoned opera house i spent like six hours the day before shooting like bleaching all the walls because it was mostly mildew and we had like right. constant um air filters running and you know we had to you know figure out how to make it safe for the the cast and crew would still make it feel like a really shitty fucked up place right um and yeah and you know so we had a lot of natural things we were battling in addition to yeah we had you know we had i think six different cars broken into throughout the course of the shoot um you know we had the grip truck got into three different accidents um (laughs) and it's like none of it was like our fault right but it just kept happening you know it's like so uh yeah we we definitely had like we're we're fighting the fucking world for some of the times on the on the shoot but um you know, and also we wanted to make something that felt really large in scope, and the more the more places, and the more people, and the more design, you know, the more challenges and potential risk. Mm-hmm. So we had all those things, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, how did you handle some of those? I mean, challenges? <laughs> it's you know, it's I had a lot of sleepless nights for sure, but uh, <laughs> it's I tried to be as like calm and collected as possible, and you know, same like you said, like you know that. You can get upset and you can you can be like mad as hell, but the moment you do that, your film, the morale of the crew is gonna slow, you know, be less, and then things will slow down. Right. The actors will will take longer to get into a place where they feel comfortable taking direction. You know, your reputation will shift. You know, right. and everyone had a, a good time on Heavy Water, all things considered. Sure. And I feel like that's like one of the bigger achievements, all things considered. So yeah, no, I could tell. Um, I mean, the day I the only day I stopped by at the church. You were like you were one of the extras in your film, and you seemed like you're having a good time. That was a that was a fun day. Yeah, yeah. that was like one of the like, things were kind of that was towards the end. So right. things were kind of like we were indoors. Started. We were in one location for three days. That was the most settled it got. Right. Um, did you guys have any like reshoots at any point? Or uh, first off, how many days? I don't know if we cover this. How many days did you guys shoot? Jeremy. The main shoot of the plays like love was two weeks, two weeks. With, a, with a known planned pickup shoot. Okay. So, um, which is the process I've heard that like. Uh, and like, how long were your days? Just all, just for me all day. I don't know. Oh, for you it was like twelve, but for like. On, twelve. Or eight. Or I don't Literally know. all day. All, all twenty four. It was like twenty four hours a day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Um, yeah. No, it was it was right. two weeks. So, like I said, most of this shoot was motivated by the location that opened up. Right. So when it opened up, that was the shoot time yeah. for all that material. And so because we knew, okay, we only have this for that. Right. All those parts of the shoot happened there. Yeah. And then we came back. Then we right into cutting mm-hmm. to see that we have everything we need. And then the pickup shoot was in New York. It was another week. Okay. Yeah. So so you need you stuck to your schedule. You didn't add any shoots. Nothing was reshot. Really? But there was definitely a pickup. Well, there, was, there would be um, things that were changed a little bit right. by the pickup, but, but gotcha. nothing had to be reshot. Gotcha. What, and what about you? Uh, we did three six day weeks. So six days on, one day off, six days on, one day off. Um, and then after the third one. Were they we, consecutive? Yeah. yeah. All back to back. And then we did three days at the end that were, uh, um, I wouldn't say they were pickups, like they were planned, but it was like the skeleton crew days. Right. Um, and then we had planned pickups for the final scene um, that we actually had to reschedule twice because um, the first time we were going to do it in Atlanta uh, and we flew in, you know, another unfortunate thing is like half the actors moved to LA afterwards. <laughs> so like um, the, you know, the, the woman that played the mom, the guy that played the dad, um, well, Alex, Alex didn't move, sorry. The, uh, and then the this young man who played um, Elliot, Right. They, they moved out. So um, okay. initially we did a day of reshoots where they flew into Atlanta where we shot the opening scene and we're going to uh, do a quick four hours of Savannah shoot for two hours on the beach and then four hours back. Um, but uh, Wes got 160 degree fever. So like all the plane tickets oh. and all the, the rentals. He's the it was like boy in the film. Yeah, all that went to, went to hell. So we lost like a couple grand. Um, and that was disappointing. So we rescheduled it in L.A., um, so I flew out there, um, and then we got the final scene, but there was um, ADR that we needed to get, that we'd been planning on getting, voiceover stuff. 
Um, but they were all on other shows and they basically slipped away for the scene. So we didn't have time to do that. So I had to fly out then again to get those, those planned pick up lines. So oh, there was wow. a lot of like, again, it was like fighting the gods, you know, yeah. you can't control 160 degree fever, canceling your shoot day after all your rentals and your plane tickets have been paid for. So stuff like that was like constant battles. But um, yeah. But we, did, so you, did you have any reshoots? Uh, you had no. an added shoot though, right? Didn't you have like an added? Yeah, yeah, we had those, those three different days of added right. things. Gotcha, gotcha. And that was like, yeah, the opening scene that was supposed to be one day where we get everything. And then we had to do another day in LA that was the beach scene because the young man got sick. And then we had to do um, a couple like, you know, we shot, I shot the needles going to my hand and I shot like a couple things I wouldn't ask actors to do. You shot it for you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So yeah, we just got acupuncture needles and stuck it into my, my hands. Oh man. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, that's like, I'm not gonna do that on set. It's been like three hours on um, just a shot. Right, yeah, just gotcha. Yeah, yeah, so stuff like that we did separately. And then there was all kinds of like little inserts and like, yeah. oh, he needs me to see the tight shot, the envelope opening here, so I'll shoot my hand. You know, so there was all, all kinds of that stuff throughout the edit process, but yeah. only three devoted pickup days. Yeah. Yeah, no reshoots, thankfully. We never had any scenes that were bad enough to like, uh, we almost actually, the scene you showed was one that we almost reshot because like, it was just like really difficult to edit. It was some of the most like plain, unmotivated, you know, visual directing. Um, we got a decent performance though, and it made sense, so we kept it in. But that was one we almost really shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it didn't seem bad at all. He's <laughs> like, I it. that's funny. Uh, so let's talk about post uh, the post process. <laughs> so um, editing, how did you guys treat that? that you know, or were you guys a part of that? Did, did you edit? I co-edited. So okay. And what, Michael Goldberg. what about you? I, I have uh, two editors I work with. So right, right, right. On a plays like Love, um, one of them was actually on set for the whole shoot. Oh, okay. Well, geez, that's awesome. Right. Which yeah. is which is great because like yeah. when you're in a time crunch, you go, right. what do, what do you need? Yeah. Right. And then he's like, I need this, this, and this, and then you go, okay. That's awesome. Uh, so that's Nils. He's on set with us. Okay. And then afterwards, because he is familiar with it, he starts to build. Uh, first rough assembly, right? Um, we, and then we start to get it into, into more shape. And then Sandro was on another job at the time, so uh, then Sandro comes in, mm -hmm. and what's great about that, especially on this one, is because he hasn't been on set, he does come to it with fresh eyes. Gotcha. Right. So his then all his input is great because it's here's the things that someone who has no idea what this is is seeing with with an editor. Right. So yeah. then, then there's that. Yeah. So did you find that you used all of your coverage, or, or did, you, did you ever, I mean? Uh, we don't use all, this was the first film where we ever, there's a one, one scene right. that was written, and we worked on it repeatedly, we mm -hmm. liked it, we shot it, and then it's not in the film. This is the first time that ever happened, where we pulled You had it, some deleted scenes? Yeah, where we pulled a whole scene out of it. I wouldn't even gotcha. call it deleted, because it's, it was, like, once you put it, in the assembly, it was never supposed to be there. Right, yeah. But you okay. can just tell, like, oh, this doesn't, it, it, it just doesn't fit. It almost dismantles some of the things that you've built. Huh, okay, interesting. Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions. Um, so, and how did you, um, oh, how did you treat the editing process? Uh, I basically, what I like to do, I have, um, whenever I do a project, I like choosing all my selects and kind of building the structure and then letting the, edit, the editor do the first rough. Um, so what would you like base the selects off? Just like so yeah, I would go through every piece of footage and I'd literally make a sequence um, right. of this is my favorite line of every delivery. So like oh wow yeah it, you know and I'd give options and stuff but yeah. so yeah every scene would have like an hour long timeline that was like these are Andrew selects and things that you should use for the edit. Um, so that way you know if, if I had the editor on set that'd be awesome because then like they would have a better idea of like when everyone hated a scene and when everyone liked it. But that for me kind of eliminates a couple cuts because. You know, that way, if the editor's just using the stuff you like, you know you're never have to go back in and be like, oh, I hate that take. We should right, you it. never have to. Yeah, have to so, so yeah, I spent a couple of days just building uh, timelines of selects for every seat. And then oh, wow. I give the editor uh, a couple of weeks, and Michael Goldberg does uh, local local shows. Um, yeah. He's a really talented guy, and yeah, he, he did a great, great job. Um, and then after he did the rough, I took it and did a cut, and we kind of bounced things back and forth. Um, my brother helped me out with the cut at one point. Like there was a couple scenes, like I just needed new new eyes on. So yeah, yeah. And that's always super important. So my brother came in and we worked on some stuff together. Um, and yeah, you know, it's editing is a tough one because it's one where like you're never ever fully satisfied. You know, like you can get close, but 
that's like, you know, you can get a, you know, lighting pretty great where you feel really good about it and performance in a place where like, oh, that was an awesome performance. But I've never, you know, editing is this the one thing where it's like, you can literally just go forever. You know, there's always <laughs> a frame you can tweak and like a slight change and a slight shift. So that was that was kind of the bulk of our post time. It was so funny because he was he was here last night just taking notes. That like he was just like, <laughs> we're all like, great job, that was awesome. And he's like, yeah, just taking some notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, um, do you do you think you'll change anything at any point? Uh, well, the thing is, like, I'm I'm already moving on to the next project. So right, right. So you're just still yeah. It's it. you know, art is abandoned, not completed. So yeah. it's it's very much that way for this. There's a million things that change. I, I feel like you're asking like real nuts and bolts questions. So yeah. I, I want like in terms of the editing process. Sure, yeah. When you said over yeah, in please. LA, my editors are LA based. Right. And so we're East Coast based. Like oh, gotcha. so the team's split in half. So it is a you're using video chats constantly for meetings like that. So right. it's not sometimes you are in the room. You'll take a flight. You know yeah. if if it's needed. But a lot of what's happening I think today is this kind of remote location. It's even more interesting when you have two editors working off, you know, cloned hard drives right. in two different locations. Yeah. And you're looking at different versions of scenes. Right. And then it all gets smashed together and then you do a watch down and then you get video chat. So yeah. the last film was a little different. I was in the room for, for a decent amount of that. But this one was almost completely remote. Oh wow. So how did you guys treat uh, sound mixing? We talked a little bit about color, but what about uh, sound? Um, uh, this one, this one was rough um, because on our first film we worked with a, a fantastic sound guy, Justin uh, Vals, yeah. and he was with us on set. He did all the on-set right. and then he did post. Uh, but this one, um, we tried to book him, but he ended up on a different project. So we, mm. we had to find someone quick. We, found a, we ended up finding a, a really solid uh, on-site guy, Drew Hudson. Gotcha. And then he was gone. And so then we w took everything to Justin. Right. So he was our post guy on it. Yeah. And uh, that was a lot of Adam and him sitting in a room, based off notes, adjusting, right. adjusting, adjusting. Yeah, gotcha. Um, what about you? Yeah, uh, we had a really great onset sound. Um, and it was, again, people I worked with. Actually, Alex Orth, the guy that gave us lights, had a great recommendation. Um, and we switched between two different sound guys. But mm -hmm. uh, post was, was a bit of a, a, a situation, because um, that was when all the money was gone. Um, and you know, yeah. sound is super important, and there's a lot of issues with sound on my movie, unfortunately. But uh, you know, it's in a perfect world, you do fully, you do full ADR sessions, uh, you make everything perfect, you mix it, and master it. And Did then... you guys do ADR in your film? No, no. Yeah. Okay, so the yeah. rain, unfortunately, was half the reason we had right. to do ours. Is like yeah. unavoidable. But um, yeah, yeah. So. Post is weird. We found a guy who's really good that would do it for cheap if we gave him enough time. So we gave him a couple months to knock it out. And then in the middle of the process, he was basically said, hey, I'm actually going to go make a documentary about my life for right. six months. So I had to pass this off. Mm -hmm. So we went between a couple of different sound designers and friends helping out. And, and is it about this. how he passed it off? <laughs> that would be funny. Yeah, a documentary about him being like, I don't know how to do this movie. Yeah. Um, no, but it's... So eventually we... You know, between me and a couple of friends, got into like a decent place, and then we handed it off to um, a girl named Serena Reichenbau, who did a really great job. Yeah. So she kind of mastered it, and then um, Joachim Horsley was our composer, and he's based in LA, um, and he is so talented. And um, yeah, I kind of gave him, um, I don't know, we call him kind of like a tone breakdown of how I wanted the things to kind of ebb and flow. And then we kind of chose our palette of instruments and what felt right for the film. You know, what was what was natural and intimate and, and kind of suited the feel of the movie, but still had kind of an orchestral feel. And we ended up going with like a, um, you know, like like wood flutes and and uh, violins, uh, single violin. And mm -hmm. then um, yeah, when he was getting close, I flew to L.A. and we we kind of finished it off together. I kind of gave him like my final notes. We did a listening in his studio, so that was that was cool. All the shorts I've written in this feature, you know, like I said, it's a river trying to find home. It's kind of it's the question being, why can't we be happy? You know, it's like which is a Corsalis. Yeah, that's definitely mm -hmm. Corsalis quote. On yeah, and that's that's something I love. And yeah, I think for me as a human being, it's like this constant struggle to be like, well, I'm happy now. No, I'm not happy. It's kind of ups and downs, and it's trying to navigate this. So right. I just. I enjoy watching and writing characters that are trying to navigate it and where we kind of belong for the ride. I mean, if, if we were to look at the films, the two that, that have just done, yeah. the question, I guess, that keeps getting asked is, why can't we communicate a little 
better to one another. Right. Why is that so complicated? Since that's what we do all the time, why are we constantly misinterpreting one another? Mm -hmm. um, which then, if you look at both films, there's you know, a way to do that dramatically. And it's also very funny that we're failing so bad to connect. Right, yeah, yeah, all definitely, the time. So yeah. For these two, for a locomotive and a place like love, I would say that's the question. <laughs>